The theme of today is moving forward, and no one does that better than Usain Bolt, the fastest man on earth. How does he do it? Obviously, he's conditioning his body to be able to um, achieve these feats, but he's also conditioning his mind at the same time. He has to overcome the psychological barriers to success in order to smash those world records, he really has to achieve greatness. Usain Bolt does not think limits. And thinking is all in your brain. Think about how your brain functions. It's doing all of these things, and many of them you don't even know are occurring. Your brain controls your body, perceives and interprets your surroundings, and provides a sense of self-identity and individuality. Your brain becomes more unique each day because you're encoding memories, you're encoding experiences um, every day. Your brain is becoming more unique to you. So how can we understand the brain? Let's start at the beginning. If we can understand how the brain develops and is wired together during development, so this is prior to birth, we can look at the building blocks of the brain and how it is uh, put together in order to function correctly throughout life. There are two major things that we know about the brain. The first is that it's made up of a number of different cells, one of which are the neurons, the electrically excitable cells in the brain that are connected together in circuits. These circuits communicate information through electrical activity or brain spikes, such as action potentials. Imagine if we can understand how that information is encoded. Imagine the uses we could have for that kind of technology. So the circuits of the brain are crucial to its function. And we can understand and visualise all the circuits in the brain using a sophisticated form of magnetic resonance imaging. So shown here are uh, some structural images of the brain achieved through a process called diffusion imaging and tractography. And so we can look inside the living human brain at all the connections that are formed and we can try to correlate that with the cognitive abilities of that person. So take the corpus callosum, for example. This is the largest fibre tract in the brain, and it connects neurons in the left and right cerebral hemispheres, the left and right sides of your brain. And it's crucial for integrating information from the two sides of the body so that you have a smooth perception of the world around you. Some people are born with a corpus callosum malformation. This occurs in about one in 3,000 live births. But what's really interesting is that the symptoms can, be very, can vary widely. So there are high-functioning people um, that might not even know that they don't have a corpus callosum. And at the other end of the spectrum, there are people with learning difficulties, they may have sensory or motor problems, and some children don't even learn to walk or talk. So how is it that you can have these widely different symptoms uh, when you have no corpus callosum? So for um, some people, we want to look at how their brain is wired and ask the question, are all brains wired the same? So here in this image, you can see on the right, a person with a genesis of the corpus callosum. And we can see that the fibers that would normally cross the corpus callosum are traveling from front to back instead of from left to right. Take this individual, she is missing a piece in the middle of her corpus callosum, and we wanted to ask the question, what happens to the fibres that would normally cross in that part that's actually missing? So we can perform this tractography and look at how the fibres are connecting up. And what's fascinating is that 
If you look at the yellow fibres here and the blue ones, you can see that some of them are moving towards um, the front part of the corpus callosum, and the yellow ones are even leaving the cortex and crossing over the midline in a completely different area of the brain, but still connecting up, re-entering the cortex on the other side and connecting to the correct area. This is a high-functioning individual. So imagine if we could understand this plasticity and how, what are the mechanisms that control this plasticity. We'd have ways of looking at how we could regenerate brain wiring and we might be able to even enhance function. So some of you might be thinking about um, doing a career in science. And so this is my career track shown here. So you'd finish high school and you'd complete perhaps a Bachelor of Science degree or maybe even medicine. And then you might do a Bachelor of Science honours or a master's degree, followed by a PhD. So when you're doing a PhD, you're a, an apprentice with another scientist and you learn how to design experiments, conduct those experiments and interpret them and then put your um, research into the context of the large body of human knowledge. At that point, you can call yourself a doctor of philosophy, and you might want to go into biotech at that point, or start your own company. Or you might stay in academia, like I did. And if you do, you might go overseas to do a, a postdoctoral training period. I happen to do mine in the US. A research laboratory is made up then of a lab head and then people who are conducting research within the lab. They could be postdoctoral scientists, technicians who usually go to the level of honours or a masters and are crucially important for the functioning of the lab, and then also students and of all different levels. So they're the people that really make up a lab. Usain Bolt does not think limits, and neither should you. You should ask the big questions, solve the big problems, and the science will move us all forward. Thank you. <laughs>